All right, Paleo Hackers, with me today, Dr. Jade Tita. Tita, right? Correct? Yep. All Perfect. right, got it. Author, naturopathic physician. He's got 25 years in the industry, personal training, weight loss. When are they going to give you a plaque, man? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they're going to do that, man. I need a lot more work to be done. Well, you got some uh, hanging up in the back there. They could put a... Uh, 25, yeah, 25 I need, years experience. I need more than that. It's just, that's just props, man. Just props. <laughs> it doesn't actually have anything on it. The books and the plaques behind you make you look more official. I got to redo <laughs> I gotta redo this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's better than just the blank wall I had 10 minutes before this call. <laughs> yeah, he just, he just moved it all over, organized it. Exactly. Yeah, man. That's good. Well, 25 years is a, is a heck of a long time. Um, yeah, yeah. Any big miracle story of how you got into it? You were just interested in the stuff? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it's funny because people ask me, they're like, 25 years, how old are you? You know, so I'm, I'm 41. I actually started when I was 15. Um, I yeah. started personal training at 15 years old, fell in love with it, started as a, you know, in football. I was a big football player and started writing programs for all of my guys on the team. That turned into writing programs for their mothers and their family members. And it just turned into a love of health and fitness, studied biochemistry in undergrad because of that. And then... Uh, went went to uh, Bastyr University in Seattle. I chose that medical school because it had a focus on lifestyle medicine, whereas conventional medical schools, when I looked at the curriculum, they don't deal with that stuff at all. But I think... Um, two hours of big, nutrition or something. Yeah, two yeah. hours less, really. I mean, it's yeah. funny. Keone, my brother and I, who I went to school with, we, tip, we do talks at different medical schools. And this is just an interesting aside for your listeners. And uh, recently, we were at one of the medical schools and we asked family physicians, there was a group of about 50 of them, and we said, who here has any training in nutrition? And one hand went up. And then we asked, who here has any formal training in exercise? And not one hand went up. That would be very different um, at the medical school that I went to and part of the reason I did what I did. But if there's one big revelation that's come out of um, sort of all my years and sort of my background, uh, and my big pet peeve, so to speak, in, in the weight loss industry and health and fitness in general is that this stuff is not one size fits all. And uh, that is, I think, the major hurdle mm. that a lot of us are dealing with because that's still the talk. You know, you still get a lot of this talk about what team are you on, essentially. You know, are you low carb or low fat? Or are you vegan? Or are you paleo? Or are you whatever it is? Yeah. And um, that's the one revelation that I've seen. And we really have to honor each person's individuality. It's awesome, man. So when you're learning more about uh, personal training, and of course, that probably led to fitness, probably led to being a naturopathic physician and stuff like that. What was kind of the biggest shocker you learned throughout the 25 years you've been doing this? What's the one thing that comes to mind that you're still surprised by to this day? Well, you know, the big thing is this, and I don't think uh, it was a huge shock, but I think everyone will get it. and You'll probably get it when I tell you. But it was essentially this. When I was young, when I was in my teens and 20s, I was working with people who were not getting results and were telling me, Jade, I'm doing everything right. I'm exercising like crazy. I'm eating less and I'm not seeing results. And at that time, I was just like, shut the hell up. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're, you're cheating on your diet. You're not getting in your workouts. You're slacking off. You're being lazy. You're a glutton. And the big shocker for me, the biggest shocker in my career was that moment when I started to deal with some of my own issues through stress, through medical school. I had a period where I bartended for about a nine-month period. I'll break this down for you guys. For about a nine-month period, my days looked like this. I basically went to medical school for full time Monday through Friday. Friday night, I went to one of the hottest clubs at the time. You're in Seattle, I know, but at the time, this was on Capitol Hill. It's called Aerospace. I don't know if it's still there, but it was a hot club 10 years ago yeah. or when I was there. And I would bartend from 9 to 4 in the morning. I would sleep two hours. I would get up and then train a 12 hour personal training shift before going back to the bar. I would then sleep all day Sunday, and then I would do medical school over again. And here's where this story connects with all these people who were saying, Jade, I'm doing everything right, not getting the results. Right. And I was just like, shut the hell up. No, you're not. Until this nine-month period destroyed me. Next thing I knew, uh, at the end of that nine months, I had gained probably 30 pounds. I was still training, by the way. I thought well, I was just putting on muscle. And uh, I was feeling like crap, obviously. And I went down to the lab because I was in medical school at the time, did my blood labs. And lo and behold, I was hypothyroid. And 
Since then, I went from a guy who was sub 10% body fat in my you know, mid-20s and uh, late 20s to someone who in his 30s has struggled uh, with weight loss, doing all the right things. You know? um, and uh, that, to me, was the biggest shocker. It was the thing that you know, as soon as you get confronted with your own bias and dogma and ignorance and arrogance in life, and I know we all have those experiences, but that happened to me. That's when the light went on and basically said, wow, you have really missed the boat with so many of your clients before because now you have the personal experience. And so since then, I've sort of become the guy for weight loss resistance and really specialize in that area because I get it on a very deep level. So fascinating how we can always conjure up excuses for why we're not getting results or why we're not doing the things we should be doing for why our job sucks and it's not our fault for why our relationship sucks and it's not our fault. We always want to protect ourselves. And I think weight loss and fitness is one of those areas where no one wants to admit that they're cheating on their diet and that's why they're 10 pounds overweight. They want to, they, they want to put it on all hormones or they want to put it on all, uh, I haven't found the right magic pill or it's just me. It's my little excuse. It's I'm the only person doing it. I go the hardest in the gym, but I'm the one who's still 10 pounds overweight. You know, we, we like to have myself included. Uh, we like to have these excuses loaded in there. And so what I'm hearing is when you're really able to get honest with yourself get clear on what you want and go for it, that's when the results actually happen. Yeah, well, you know, I think you bring up, I think you and I are saying two different things here, and I think it's important because here's the thing that I'm saying for some people, those people who were stuck, and by the way, they were in the minority, right? These people who were saying, I'm doing everything right and really were, they were in the minority, but there is a subset of people who have issues related to metabolism that keep them from losing weight. But And you bring up a very important point, which is also a huge pet peeve of mine, right? Which is the other side is that there are more people probably who do not have these issues, who want to pretend they do have these issues and not be doing the things that work. And so, again, this one size fits all idea. Some people would say everybody, no one has hormonal issues. And other people would say everyone's lazy. And the truth of the matter is, is some people do, they're in the minority, have hormonal issues that are going to keep them struggling with weight loss. But to your point, most people, right, most people because of human psychology are not actually doing everything right. And here's what I would say, and this even holds for those who are dealing with PCOS, hypothyroid, changes around menopause. You are not doing everything right if you're not getting the results. I want to say that again. If you're not getting the results, then you're not doing everything right. And here's what I mean by that. You could be following you know, uh, your, your plan right, or my plan or some other person's plan. But if that's not the right plan for you, you're not doing it right. And so what we need to be focusing on is how do we teach people to find the right plan for them so that they're not struggling so that they're not uh, battling willpower all the time, so that they can actually do what they need to do. To your point, though, I think that there is a very key issue here, that it's a non-starter. You do have to, at some point, change something. There's no way of getting around that. Do you find the success ratio or the people who stick at it is very high in in your programs or other people's programs? Because it seems like... When I think of that person who I was talking about, the one who wants to kind of shove off responsibility and jump around, jump around, that's what they're doing. They're just hopping from Jade's program to, you know, Sean Croxton's program to Dr. Oz's program to whatever. Yep. And that's why they're not getting the results. They don't give it enough time to work. They don't stick at it. They don't have laser targeted focus and allow their program to actually start giving them results. Uh, there's a question in there somewhere. Uh, no, I agree with you 100%. I think it's a very astute uh, thing to point out that people really need to get. And to me, it's this idea, and I call it program jumping or program ADD. We, are, we almost act like, you know, and this is a little bit tough love in here, and, you know, so I apologize if it feels like I'm lecturing people. I'm really not. I just think because I'm the same. We're all human. So I have some of these tendencies as well because our human brains do this. But we love, we act, almost act like children. We chase the new shiny object, the new shiny workout program, the new shiny diet. 
And we think very wrongly that there's a diet out there somewhere that's going to deliver us the holy grail, the right diet for everybody. And what I'm trying to say is that that does not exist. And by jumping from program to program to program to program and acting like a child almost with this program ADD, ADHD, I think it's exactly what you're talking about. That's the main reason why people don't get results. I call it the dieting mentality. It's really the idea that these people, and when I say these people, I mean me too, because I've certainly fallen prey to this at times in my life, basically have this idea of they would rather be looking for something to do than doing something. They'd rather be looking for something to do than doing something. Actually, psychology research tells us, doesn't it? It's basically like it's humans have this very weird quirk about our brain. As soon as we find something that works, we promptly want to go and look for something else that works. It's just partly how our psychology works. And so what I would say is the fix to this for people is to stop being a dieter. And I like to say start being a detective instead of your own metabolism. Figure out how this stuff works. Sure, you're going to pick up some things from Clark. You're going to pick up some things from me. You're going to pick up some things from all the books you read. So it's not that we don't want you to educate yourself. It's just that uh, do what Bruce Lee said, right? My favorite, one of my favorite heroes is Bruce Lee. And he said, listen, take what is useful, discard what is not, and add what is uniquely your own. And this is how we should be approaching weight loss, in my opinion. Great quote, man. It's almost though that like, that discovery, what you were talking about, you know, they're trying to be a detective, but I can totally see why people get hooked on that high of reading a new diet book or reading a new weight loss book. Cause there's that promise that at the end of it, you're going to magically lose the last 10 pounds or you're going to have excess energy. Or you're going to sleep better and have great sex. I mean, whatever that promise is at the end of the book, it's almost that anticipation of it that you get hooked on when you get a book from Amazon that you ordered and paid for. And it's like Christmas when the box comes and you read the table of contents and you go like, that's a great feeling. So people get hooked on that program jumping mentality and it's not so much that they don't trust the program they're on, but they love that quick, they love that uh, anticipation to keep using that word on the next yeah. program. Yeah, I agree. And actually, Clark, here's an interesting thing that a lot of people may not know. Uh, most people who are familiar with exercise research know the A to Z study. It's a very big ongoing sort of weight loss trial, right? You know, it's, it's, it's a, a very well looked at study on weight loss. And what they found is essentially the following, which sometimes shocks people, is that when people are asked about diet X, for instance, the, a book that they read, um, this is hilarious. They don't actually, they can't even define what diet X was, yet they claim diet X did not work. And again, this isn't a judgment, and this isn't me saying and lecturing, this is just me saying our quirks of human psychology are such that we're constantly deluding ourselves. Because so you can imagine these studies that are essentially showing people go out and buy a book, they flip through it really quickly, they don't actually understand it because they haven't spent as much time with it. Yeah. And then they try whatever they're trying to do for a couple of weeks, and then they promptly shut the book and claim it does not work, and then they're on to the next thing. And so I think that what you're bringing up here is very, very important, something that is not talked about a whole lot. But what it essentially says is that not only are we battling sort of uh, the need to, you know, eat appropriately and eat smarter and move and exercise, but more importantly, we're battling our own delusional state in our brain. The default state of the human brain is working against us constantly. So you have to ask yourself, did I actually even understand this particular program before I tried to do the program. And what we're, you and I are talking about is we're taking it one step further. We're essentially saying, sure, read every book that comes out. Go out and read all these blogs. Get people's different opinions on this. Understand it and then tweak it, adjust it, dial it in for you. If you're able to do that and buck the trend of the delusional dieter, you're going to have a chance of much better success. No one goes to the gym once and then gets pissed off that they didn't gain muscle. That sounds ridiculous. You'd be like, you're an idiot. You have to go consistently. You have to show up. You have to go, you know, four, three times a week for months on end before you really get results. But people are mad and they feel like they should be rewarded for that one time. And I think that's what we're talking about with diet and why this is such an important 
10 minute preface to what we're going to be talking about this whole call is that no matter what we talk about, no matter what diets we're going over, no matter what tips, what hacks, what you should eat and shouldn't eat, it doesn't matter if you don't stick with it. You got to give it enough time to work, just like your workouts. Yeah, let me say one more thing about that because I think, you know, what you're tapping in here is like literally, this is probably the most important stuff in the weight loss industry. Sure. If you cannot be consistent in something, if it's something that you cannot do over the long run, it's a failure. And so here's what I mean by that. People talk about the perfect diet. You know, to me, uh, wild Pacific salmon and kale at every meal is the perfect diet. But that doesn't mean anything if you're not going to prep it, you're not going to cook it, you don't like the way it tastes. And so that's what's really interesting here. Some people don't like fish. Some people can't stand kale. It doesn't matter how healthy it is and what it looks like on paper. What matters is the doability of what you're trying to do. And that is where we should be focused. So when we think to ourselves, I can't do this, or a professional, personal trainer, doctor, whatever says, this person isn't being compliant. Instead of berating yourself or berating that person and saying, you're just a lazy glutton, what we need to be doing is we need to be thinking, okay, I need to adjust this. If I can't do it, then I need to find something I can do. And that's why it's so important to adjust this. Now, you and I could talk all day about uh, tricks and hacks and tweaks. And a lot of times people will say, well, Jade, if that's the case, then you're really just saying throw all the rules out the window. And in a sense, I'm saying we need guidelines, not rules. Rules are black and white. Guidelines can be molded and adjusted. They're meant, they're gray. And so instead of rules, think guidelines. And with guidelines, now we have what I call structured flexibility, which essentially means Clark can give you some information. Jade can give you some information. Someone else can give you some information. That's structure. And they provide sort of here's a blueprint, things that have worked for my patients, things that have worked for me. But the flexibility in there is you understanding how your body is responding to this. Does it satisfy you hunger wise? Does it satiate you? Does it stop cravings? Does it balance energy? Does it keep your mood stable? If it does, and you're also getting weight loss results and your blood chemistries are getting better, then in a sense, I don't care if you're living off Snickers bars, that diet is working for you. I mean, I doubt that's actually going to be the case, but if you're, if you're eating all Snickers bars and your hunger, energy, and cravings are in check, you're losing weight, your blood labs are getting better, then I don't care what popular book says, including mine. Sure. You'll never see a book that says the consistency diet, you know? (laughs) It just doesn't sell, man. It's not sexy at all. Who wants to read that? That's boring. We don't want the things that we know already, right? We I know that already. I've heard that already. I've done that call already. You know, like we we have this like, give me the new stuff, Doctor Jade. (laughs) Give me the hacks. Talk about cold thermogenesis, high intensity interval training, and fasting. Yeah, 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 that's my book. Ten pounds in ten days with Kim Kardashian. Let me tell you this to your point, Clark, and you're so right on point. Because look, here's a guy who's wrote two diet books, right? Yeah. And I'll tell you, my last book. You know, and it's funny, uh, I may not do traditional publishing again because my last book is a book all about structured flexibility and a lot of stuff you and I are talking about. But the name of it is called the lose weight here diet. Why? Because there's one little aspect about when you how to attack stubborn fat. That's the one part that the publishers grab hold of when actually it's a teeny part of the book. Now, maybe you and I could argue, hey, that's what's going to sell. That's what it's going to get people to pick up the book. But I'm starting to get, and I think you're starting to say, and I think a lot of people are starting to get a little bit fed up with that because what it does is it feeds into exactly what we're, we're talking about. So to me, it is structured flexibility. It is something you can do consistently. I think your term of saying consistency, consistency, that is what it is. But then we have to realize that one person's diet that allows them to be consistent is another person's diet that throws them all over the place and causes them to go binge and purge. And so we have to make room for that. Sure. And I realize we're talking about how hacks and tricks are dumb on the Paleo Hacks podcast, which is ironic. (laughs) But what what, what we're saying is like, yeah, that stuff's fun and it's great to talk about. And sure, I love as much as the next guy to read about cold thermogenesis and like, you know, intense interval training and all that stuff and supplements. I mean, I used to go crazy on supplements. That was fun, man. It's it's a cool part of this hobby, which is your health and your diet and weight loss. It's really a hobby and you learn about it, try things and throw it out. But 
it's not the main thing. And if we can reframe it and refocus it towards hate using it because it's on every call, but the 80 20 principle of yeah. really looking at what 20% of what we do, everything we do is giving us the 80% of our results, probably diet, it's probably sleep, and it's probably movement, you know, right there. Yeah. Yeah. But don't you dare talk about that because that won't sell in a book, Dr. Right. Jade. And, and here's the thing. Talking about paleo hacks, right, and hacks, what's really interesting is I would actually say that once you get this individualized concept, it's all about hacking your diet, just not in the way most people think about it. It's not that everyone needs to be taking green tea extract and doing high-intensity interval training. It's basically that people need to hack their own metabolism. So, for example, um, there are certain foods – probably Clark for you and certain foods for me that are what I would call buffer foods. When you include them in your diet, they give you satisfaction, right? You like the way they taste, they feed your brain chemistry, and they quell your hunger, and they keep you from eating cheesecake later or junk food later. Those buffer foods are different for everyone. That's a hack. Find your buffer food. Likewise, everybody has trigger foods. I know some people can have a little square of dark chocolate yeah. And that keeps them from going crazy later. I know for me, that does not work. That might cause me to have something worse later. That is a hack. And so what we need to be doing is we need to be understanding what are my hacks. So when I hear Jade say something about, for instance, using cocoa powder to crush cravings because cocoa is so good to amp up dopamine and serotonin in the brain and stop cravings. Instead of thinking, oh my God, I'm going to go out and buy all the cocoa at Whole Foods, you want to be like, is this a hack that is going to work for me? Um, there's a recent study. Here's another hack. A recent study just came out last week in diabetes, and you've probably heard this before because a lot of people in, um, have talked about doing this, but there was never a study to verify it. But the idea of eating protein and vegetables before you eat your starch versus the reverse and how that has a better insulin response and a better blood sugar response and likely a better weight loss response. Mm. Same amount of calories, same foods, just eaten in a different order. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a hack. Will that work for you? For instance, sweet potato. Are you going to eat less of the sweet potato if you eat the chicken breast and the broccoli first? Maybe for most people that will happen. Maybe for others it won't. So when we talk about hacks, what we need to be talking about is what do I do at my meals, within my workouts, at home, right, that is going to help me sort of stay on point. And what I would say is, to your point, 80-20, right, I mean, we can pretty much say, here's the structured part, we can pretty much say with the research and clinical experience, 80% of diet and exercise, and I'll talk about diet first, essentially comes down to this, eat as many vegetables as you can, Eat enough protein to satiate you, meaning keep hunger low, and then add enough salt, sugar, starch, fat to satisfy you, to give you that taste, to give you that brain ping, but not so much that pushes you over the edge. So it's that little piece about salt and starch and sugar and fat. Those are where all the hacks have to happen. They're going to be different for you. Same thing around exercise, this idea that you know, um, cardio is going to kill you is ridiculous, right? I mean, some people cardio works great for. For other people, cardio is not so great for. 80% of it's going to come down to doing something to keep your muscle on you, which yeah. is going to be high intensity weight training and things like that. And then 20% is going to come down to, well, you know what, Clark Jade, I love Zumba. And you might, you and I might say, well, you know what, Zumba is probably not going to help get the weight off you or make you lean. But if it's fun and you like it and it keeps you moving, then do it. This is what I mean when I talk about hacks, all these things that really are adjustments. So yeah, you get the baseline to 80%, like you said, and then that 20% is actually what keeps you consistent and in line, in my opinion. Love that Zumba class. You know me. <laughs> I get the little Zumba skirt on. I heard you're a big Zumba fan, man. <laughs> the one with the coins that jingle when you're, when you're shaking it. Yeah, man. Great. LA Fitness. <laughs> It's true though, man, you really got to find out and to keep drilling this point, like what works for you, because one person can get it and say, oh yeah, I shouldn't clear out whole foods of cocoa powder once I hear Dr. Jade talking about that. But the other person might hear their doctor say, okay, two glasses of red wine's healthy. And they read that online, like, ooh, it's heart healthy. Okay. And they go to their cupboard and they take the 
biggest glass they can find. They get a one liter mason jar and fill that sucker up all the way. Cause, and they do two of those because that's two glasses to them. Yep. So yep. It's totally different for everyone. And yes. again, honesty, consistency, and what works for you. But uh, before before that, even you talked about something I want to touch on for the listeners. That is trigger foods and buffer foods. Can you dive a little more into that? Yeah, I mean, think about it this way. Trigger foods are going to be things that um, trigger hunger, trigger cravings in that moment or later. So let me give you an example. Most people think that breakfast is separate from lunch and lunch is separate from dinner and snacks have nothing to do with either one of those, any of those meals. The truth is what you eat for breakfast or don't eat for breakfast is going to directly impact what you have, how much you have, and what you crave to eat for lunch. Hmm. So an example would be you have a cup of coffee and a donut for breakfast versus scrambled eggs and some asparagus and blueberries. You're going to probably be craving more junk food later by 10 a.m. or at 12 p.m. In other words, if you have that donut and coffee, you're far more likely to go to Chipotle and get a big boo-boo burrito instead of the burrito bowl or something like that. People don't understand this. And so we need to be asking ourselves, what are those trigger foods? What are the things that trigger me to do worse things later? By the same token, buffer foods are those things that when I eat them, for instance, if I have a protein shake in the morning, yeah, it's not, you know, it's a little bit of a processed food, but if I have it, it keeps me having a salad instead of a burger at lunch. That is then a good choice. So that would be a buffer food for you. Here's the interesting thing. Wine. You brought up wine. Is it a trigger food or is it a buffer food? People would say to me and you, right, they would say, well, they want the black and white rule. It's actually both. For some people, they can come home, have their salmon and their kale and have four ounces of red wine, a nice red wine, and that keeps them from getting into the Ben and Jerry's later. Other people, right, have that wine and then have another glass of wine, then have another glass of wine, and then because of that, end up going into the Ben and Jerry's. And so you need to know. Floodgates open, yeah. The floodgates open. And that's when sometimes a cheat meal, right, some people, a cheat meal turns into a cheat week because what they did was they hit all these palatable foods. Now let's talk a little bit about the science here rather than just this experiential idea that we're going through. Science now is telling us in rat studies, and it's starting to emerge in humans as well, that highly palatable foods – when overdone, will cause you to eat more at that meal and eat more of the wrong things later. So in other words, you eat a highly palatable meal, bacon and butter and, you know, uh, starch and sugar and salt and all these combinations of these highly engineered foods, they're going to be likely for many, many people to be trigger foods and cause you to eat more junk food later. We all know what this is like, right? Think about the Thanksgiving experience. Think about any time you do a cheat meal and how sometimes that cheat meal turns into a cheat week. These are things you have to be aware of. Meanwhile, you know, something like wine, right, or chocolate or or butter or bacon or, you know, things like that for some people or peanut butter. For some people, those act as buffer foods. They have just enough. It gives them enough of that brain chemistry tweak, but not so much that it satisfies them and helps them feel better. Here's another distinction, by the way. Satiation versus satisfaction, right? In the health and fitness world, we talk about things like, you know, what's better for weight loss than chicken and broccoli, right? Especially if it's organic, organic chicken and broccoli. The problem is that's satiating. It suppresses hunger. But, but it's it not sucks. satisfying. Yeah, it that's sucks. right. It sucks. So we need to put as much satisfaction into our foods as possible enough enough to satisfy us but not so much to send us off on this crash course of eating this is the idea of trigger foods and buffer foods and it's different for everybody just get some hot sauce and barbecue yeah. packs exactly sriracha or something like that yeah. some people that's going to trigger off you know uh you know smorgasbord of eating and other people it's going to be just what they needed to not have dessert and overeat later sriracha has gluten in it how dare you <laughs> How dare you promote that on this show? Oh my it, gosh! It, exactly, and I mean, I am so I pure. I never heretic. have gluten ever. How dare I don't want to be the heretic on your show, Clark. But here's another thing I'll say, and you could yell at me. But here's here's what I would say. Again, these rules: gluten 
is a big, big issue for a minority of people. It's a huge issue for a minority of people. Matter of fact, people in my field have been talking about that for years, screaming and yelling, and now all of a sudden it's mainstream, which you're happy about. However, the idea that everybody is going to have issues with gluten is absolutely ludicrous. In fact, most people don't. And so the if and here's why I say this, because let's say you're one of these rule people and you've heard, you know what? Gluten is bad. Therefore, I'm going to cut gluten out. And so instead of having gluten free, or instead of having gluten muffins, you start eating gluten free everything. Well, guess what a gluten free muffin has less protein. Typically, it's less satiating. It usually has more refined sugars in it, sends your blood sugar skyrocketing. Next thing you know, because you cut out gluten, now you're eating worse things. So that becomes a trigger for you. And we don't quite understand how this works oftentimes. So we need to put our biases and our dogma aside when it comes to nutrition in my mind. And when you do that, you would open up a whole new world. You stop being a dieter. You start being a detective and you start figuring this stuff out. And it makes more sense. I'm with you on the gluten in terms of like being dogmatic about it and chilling out and definitely with the weight loss thing, like, you know, when people make lateral shifts from the gluten uh, grains to the gluten free grains, but they're actually eating more crap and less protein and less other things. That's terrible. Where I differ is when it's like a problem for a lot of people. I think a lot of people, I think the real issue isn't, is it a problem for you or isn't? It's that we have really bad tests for it. You know, like we yeah, test like absolutely. we test the, the gut. Uh, microbiome and all that stuff that really doesn't really reveal anything because it's it can be causing inflammation and how the heck are you going to test for that without doing an elimination diet and like you were yep. saying earlier no doctor is going to be like oh all right Sally well I, I did this test and now I'm, I'm I'm recommending an elimination diet so let's work together for a month and we'll see you know if it's it, it, over that month I'll chart everything you do and you get my undivided attention like no doctor has time for that so we can't really test for it and so it really is an individual thing to like see how gluten responds in you. Yes, your caution is perfect, right? Because, and I'm glad you made that distinction because, again, that's what people will do. They'll be like, oh, Jade's saying gluten is not an issue. He's being emphatic about it. No, I'm not saying that. And I'm glad you made that clear because I'm actually not saying that at all. I'm saying it. It's a big, huge issue for some people. It's not an issue for others. Now, you might say, okay, so now... If you got lost in what Clark was saying about how do you find out if it's an issue for you? Well, we, be, we use the gold standard is a, an elimination diet. So you just take gluten out of the diet. You do it as a trial, but you do it under the auspices of being a detective. You don't do it as a dieter. You don't do it and say, I'm never having gluten again. You do it in a way to basically say, you know what? I'm interested to see how my metabolism responds. Does my gas and bloating go away? Does my psoriasis clear up? Do I start losing weight or do things go the opposite way? When I cut out gluten, do those things get worse? Does my gas and bloating get worse? Does my psoriasis get worse? Do my headaches get worse? Do my blood labs get worse? Am I starting to gain weight? And so instead of just making these hard and fast rules, what we want to be doing is we want to be saying, let me see. And then, of course, sometimes, oftentimes, especially when it comes to gluten and things like that, you're going to want to see somebody who can walk you through this process. So gluten is probably not the best example to use when we talk about trigger, trigger and buffer foods because it is very gray and there's a lot we still don't know. But the fact remains that being a detective and not jumping on board these extremes just because everyone else is doing it is going to help you in the end rather than hurt you, in my personal opinion. I want to ask you something based on your 25 years experience and working with people and even yourself, what do you think in terms of meal frequency? Um, yeah. Kind of what's the general rules? And then I, I guess some more loaded questions is where does fasting fit into that at all? So yeah. I, I guess I, there's two questions there. Let's take meal frequency yeah. first. It's To me, it, it's a very, very easy. And I did, I've done a whole blog on this over at metaboggeffect.com if you guys are interested in this meal frequency. How frequently should you eat, right? We can make arguments up and down. There are studies actually that show both are beneficial. Studies that show three times per week is the way to go, or three times per day rather is the way to go. And studies that show six times per day is the way to go. The consensus, by the way, if you want to know the consensus on the research, it leans more frequent eating for athletes and very active people. It leans less frequent eating for those who are not that active. But the truth of the matter is, I have seen this all over the place clinically. And the research is all over the place. So what does that tell you? That tells you it's very individual. So I have 
uh, a little acronym I use. It's called HEC, and it stands for Hunger, Energy, and Cravings. If you want to know the meal frequency that's going to work for you, it's going to be the frequency that keeps your hunger, energy, and cravings stable. You will not be hungry, your energy will be high, and your cravings will be low. Here's an example. Let's say Clark and I decide we're going to eat three times per day. We're going to see how that does for us. I have my normal breakfast. I have my lunch. I'm fine. But then around 3 o'clock, right, around 3 o'clock, I am just jonesing for something. And that, and, and I, I suck it up. I use willpower. But then when I get to dinner, I am so hungry and my brain chemistry is so out of whack that I eat from 5 o'clock to 11 o'clock until I pass out in an insulin coma. That basically means that that three meals per day probably didn't work for me. So the next day I come back and I say, well, let me see. What if I have a preemptive meal right around 2.30, 3 o'clock, some protein, some good quality starch, some vegetables. And all of a sudden when I get to dinner and I'm kind of like, ah, I could eat and I can make a nice healthy dinner and stop eating. Then that tells me four meals per day is my good point. Versus three. And this is, again, what we must do. Intermittent fasting is one of the best fat loss tools I have ever seen. It is also one of the worst fat loss tools I have ever seen, depending on the person. Think about it. And I know a lot of obese people, Clark, you probably do too. Many people you know, know this who essentially do intermittent fasting. They wake up, sure. they skip breakfast, they get to lunch and they have a teeny tiny little salad, right? Or nothing at all. Then they get to home and they have continuous meal from 5 to 11. And they and in our day and age, and here's what I think people need to understand, back in our paleo ancestors, they could not go to a restaurant and consume 4,000 calories in one sitting. We have, we have McDonald's. We have Cheesecake Factory. We have Domino's. We have, the, we have Ben and Jerry's. We have the ability to go all day, be so famished that we can consume 3,000 calories. 2,000, 4,000 calories in a sitting. And if you're someone who tries intermittent fasting and finds that's being the case, then it is a nightmare for you. However, for other people like me, right, I'm a big muscle bound dude. I hold on, I'm very anabolic. I hold on to my muscle very well. I, I do intermittent fasting. I get to the end of the day, I can eat normally. And here's a hack, by the way. I'll give you one hack here for many people who are doing intermittent fasting and finding that they're overeating too much, there's one key. Have a preload before you break your your fast. So break your fast with a preload. A preload means something before you eat, which Mm. typically I do a protein shake. That'll satiate you, balance brain chemistry, keep you from overeating. But the point is it works wonderfully for me. It works wonderfully for me. It's not going to work wonderfully for most people. And you know what? It might work wonderfully for you. Here's what I found it works most for. We're all on a journey in my mind, right? Health and fitness journey. This is sort of like, you know, um, you start and you finish. And it's sort of like the Zen Buddhists going on their spiritual journey. In the beginning, right, they're kind of looking at things a particular way and they're very much in their head. And then they come to a place where they're just like, wow, I kind of get it now and and I understand how this works. Well, it's the same thing. You don't take somebody who's all in their head and tell them to stop thinking. They won't know what you're talking about. You don't take someone who's just starting out their journey and say, you know what, just don't eat, you know, until dinner time because that person doesn't have the practice in health and fitness to make the right choices and deal with that insatiable hunger and craving issues that might pop up later. So meal frequency, once again, it depends. And we, you and I could pretty much go back to the beginning and basically say every answer to pretty much every question you and I talked about today is it depends. Sure. But there's an awful lot of hacks you could do within that. Which is frustrating for people to hear when they want answers. And they, want, right. they want gurus and they want people to tell them exactly what to do. They want to join a club. And whether yeah. it's the paleo tribe, whether it's the vegan tribe, whether it's this tribe, they want their identity wrapped up in food, which is a ridiculous thing when you really think about it. It's like... I, I like identifying by what you eat is probably the stupidest thing we can ide- choose to identify ourselves <laughs> by. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's like politics and religion now, right? So add that, add nutritional yeah. choices to the politics and religion. Sure. Debate. Sure. Yeah, no, for sure. Like the things you can't discuss at the dinner table, ironically, is what you're eating in front of you right now because yep. sparks fly and they go everywhere, man. I agree. Uh, yeah. Okay. So 
I guess our last little topic I had down here that I wanted to go over with you was just supplementation and adding different things in. I mean, 25 years, long time. You've seen that industry change, come and go. Things have stuck around. What's your take? Yeah. Well, here's an interesting thing. I'll give you a recent study just published this year where they basically looked at uh, a year. I like this study because it was a year long and basically had two groups of people, one group of people. And this will speak right to the paleo crowd. So you guys can yell at me if you want. But there are two groups of people. One group of people dieted using whole foods. No supplements, no protein bars, no protein shakes, none of that stuff. The other group was giving protein bars and protein shakes. And they followed them for a year. Low calorie diet. Who do you think lost the most weight? Both groups, low calorie diet, they both lost the same amount of weight. But when they analyzed these people for deficiencies, guess who came up with the most deficiencies? The whole food group, do you think? Or the group that was doing supplements, supplementation with protein bars and protein shakes? Well, the whole foods group was the one that was shown most deficient in nutrients, which might surprise people. But think about this. It's a low calorie diet. Whole foods are difficult to get. They're difficult to prepare. Uh, Most people eat the same 10 foods day in and day out for convenience purposes. And so the point is this. this, The reason I bring that up is because there's a big bias and a big dogma against never have processed protein bars and protein shakes and things like that. But in this case, it actually was more nutritious for people than just doing the whole foods. Now, here's the thing. Ideally, You do whole foods more in a well-rounded fashion, but not everyone can do that. So that's my first point. My first point is put your biases aside and understand we live in a convenience-driven world, and nowadays we're going to have to do convenience-based foods. If you don't like protein shakes, fine. Do jerkies and things like that if it's more paleo-based for you. So from my point of view, I'm a big fan of food-based supplements first. So here's my rule of thumb. One, whole foods first. Get as many whole foods as you can, but don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Also use convenience-based foods that have full spectrum vitamins and minerals in it if you can, meal replacements, bars, things like that, as whole food as possible. And then understand, again, you live in a world where we, unfortunately, and these, this is the case, we've seen this, our soil is depleted. We live in a high-stress world. We eat the same kinds of foods day in and day out. Supplementation may be necessary for you. But let's not make the mistake to say it's necessary for everyone. If you got someone living in rural North Carolina where I am and they live on a farm and they have grass-fed cattle and they can get all their stuff and they're eating all these whole meals, they may not need to supplement. But you got someone in New York City who's on Wall Street going crazy, working out constantly, doing all this stuff and not able to get whole foods in their diet, Supplements may be needed. And so from that perspective, I'm a fan of uh, convenient functional foods. I'm also a fan of supplements when they're necessary. I think we all could agree whole foods need to be the base. If you can't get that right, and and I think you said it best, to be honest with you, 80-20, again, 80% should be whole foods. But do not be afraid to use that other 20% to round out your nutrition. In today's day and age, don't be a Luddite. You know what a Luddite is? People don't remember back when typewriters came out. They called them Luddites. They were afraid of the technology of the typewriter. They were afraid it was going to you know, kill all the scribes and ruin industry. So they went out breaking typewriters. Don't be a nutritional Luddite. Let science help us. It may not be perfect now, but eventually it will get better. Sure. You don't have to go crazy too with the biohacking stuff and install like insulin pumps into you and just to like track yourself and prick your times 80 times a day. Like I've heard people (laughs) strap neurons to their head. You know, like you don't have to go crazy, man. That's the deep end. Logical. Yeah. You don't have to be a Luddite too. I mean, you can find your little middle ground and take multivitamins or whatever you think might help um, and and really, you know, pinpoint it for you based on, on your needs and your wants. And of course, that takes research and that takes uh, looking at articles like you got over there. And I wanted to give you some time to maybe just talk about your latest book, Lose Weight Here, going over some of the concepts we've been having on the call. It sounds like in your book, correct? Yeah, the book is called Lose Weight Here. The title does not really say what it's really about. It's really about becoming a diet detective. So uh, we have two books. One's called The Metabolic Effect Diet. One's called Lose Weight Here. So if you're like kind of the approach that you know we've been discussing, that's where to look. And you also can find me at metaboggeffect.com. I'm also, I mean, I know how you know the, the, the today's day and age is great in terms of social media and stuff like that. People who have questions for me, 
Twitter, tweet me. I'll actually answer it because I can do it in a very short and doesn't take me a lot of time. But yeah. shoot me a tweet. I'm at Jade Tita on Twitter, and I'll answer questions there as well. But, um, bro, I appreciate you. Thanks for letting me come uh, hang with you. Yeah. And uh, I really appreciate it. It's a really fun discussion for me because, to me, this is the kind of stuff yeah. where the rubber meets the road. So hopefully people got some good insights over it. Cool, man. Yeah, you're a great guest. This is awesome, dude. Uh, must be the Seattle in us. Makes yeah. sense. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I miss it, bro. I, I'm actually going to be there probably four or five months. So, uh, oh, cool. I'm, com- I'm coming out there to give a talk in Portland and I'm seeing friends in Seattle. Yeah. So, I'm, I miss it. I haven't been back in 10 years. So. Yeah, great times, man. Tour guide Clark over here. Yeah, yeah, dude. I'll, I'll definitely hit you up, man. We got uh, we got apartment buildings coming everywhere. Everyone else who's listening right now in Seattle, like, it's, it's crazy. It's the biggest boom, I think, in the United States in terms of cities because the Seahawks won or whatever. But, uh, oh, it's nuts, man. It's just, you can't go anywhere. <laughs> without seeing a new apartment yeah I'm, I'm, well i'm kind of pissed man that after i left the seahawks got real good that yeah. bothers me <laughs> yeah man i'm a bandwagon fan over here so uh, you know that's all right you gotta be you gotta i just be. hop on when they're, when they're good <laughs> <laughs> all right dr j thanks for coming on man thanks a lot my man be all good right. guys Later. See you.